The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! Welcome into Views from the Sideline. I'm Joey Tysick. Across from me, Malik Hill. And uh, basketball season is kind of still going on. It's Joey's just favorite back time, up. summer league Gosh, season. Dang the it. best part of the year. Uh, I don't know how to get hyped up about it. <laughs> um, but USA basketball is also going on. We got the Olympics coming up in a couple of weeks. So there's a lot of exhibition games, which are kind of fun to watch right now. With as global as the game is right now. And the NBA Summer League is in full swing, which, you know, most slappies appreciate, but me, not so much. I like seeing some of the young guys, but I can only watch for so long and have to turn it off. So we'll talk about those. Um, And then we got a little little list today about uh, guys that aged well into their late seasons of the NBA or um, guys that were able to transition their game to be able to play later um kind of however we want to interpret it but um right off the bat let's just talk about usa basketball they've had a couple little exhibition games um one against uh they've played canada yeah serbia canada Canada, they play close against canada real close against australia yeah and And they blew out serbia today yeah um that's important because basically all of those teams are in the upper echelon of the Olympic teams, I would say. Um, There's maybe a couple others that are possible to make a run. France. France is one of them. Spain is always tough. Yep, Spain is tough. Um, I think Greece, just having Giannis at this point, seems like they're pretty pretty tough. Um, The thing that scares me is they did uh, introduce or release the pools for the Olympic bracket. And USA has Puerto Rico in their pool. Listen, Jose Alvarado is the, is the new Carlos Arroyo. Exactly. But this this team is too stacked. Yeah. They're not going to be it's, team It's USA. not the same, but anyway. Um, USA basketball looking pretty good. Steph Curry's first USA team. Uh, pretty cool to watch. Um, and it's interesting to have this mix of older guys and pretty young talent all at the same time. Um I don't know. What do you think about USA yeah. basketball? They- I I watched the um most of the game today. I missed a lot of the first quarter because I forgot it started at noon. Mm. But just a few takeaways. Uh, seeing Anthony Davis and Bam Adebayo play together on defense put a smile on my face. It it was such a joy watching them two, like not fouling at all, swatting away shots, just playing intense defense. Mm-hmm. Uh, it took a while for them to get going. They're still figuring out how to play together. Yeah. But in the second half, they just took off, and it was beautiful to watch. I don't think Joel Embiid is a good fit on this team. Yeah, I think kinda... I think AD and Bam should be the bigs. They make sense in international basketball. Joel still tries to foul bait. He's still super skilled, but like it takes so long for him to get to his moves. Yeah. It's it's awkward to watch in FIBA ball, and they could play a lot a, a lot quicker pace with Bam and AD. Um, I think those guys will kind of rotate out. Yeah, Bam also looks really good on offense in this game, which is really yeah. cool to see. He hit a few threes today. The other hard part too is like USA can play small or big depending on how they want to do it because they can play like Jason Tatum at the four. Yeah, um, Anthony Edwards has been at the two at times. I've seen Devin Booker play like the three. I'm I'm most excited, honestly, for Steph Curry to show the world. Not that they don't Listen, already know. In, t- in the second quarter of today's game, he hit a hot streak where mm-hmm. it was it was good old Steph. Like nine straight points, the nine points it got him. He hit a, a three pointer and one, so he hit a three, got fouled and hit the free throw that put him up by like ten. I was it, mm-hmm. just regular Steph. And I would say to me, a lot of the international guards are a lot smaller, typically. 
unless of course you're playing Shea and Team Canada. Yeah. But there's a lot of international teams that have smaller size guards. So Steph Curry's not going to have to work against the big guards that we've seen him have to take on for years. So he might get better looks, which is terrifying for other teams. So it's kind of fun. Um, I'm excited to see actual Olympic play, though, because the ex- the exhibition games are hard, too, because it's everybody like, trying to get into a rhythm. Right. And some teams are were vying for spots to get in. And now some teams are just getting warm ups. So you don't know exactly how the team's going to play in the Olympics. So, But it's cool to see what we're getting ready to get towards. Um, and then the Summer League. I've watched a little bit. I'll be honest. You will be happy, Joey. But uh, Besides the first two days, I haven't watched a ton. Nice. I really haven't. But um, I've watched a, a decent amount of highlights just so that I can keep up. Um, the Pistons rookies looking pretty good so far. Um, Ron Holland has shown some signs. Hasn't been super efficient. Yeah, he's still raw, obviously. Mm-hmm. But And the big surprise that everybody likes right now is Bobby Clintonman. He's been hitting threes a lot. Yeah. Um, he's four, just he was fluid. Four, of, four of six from three last game. Yeah. He's like just 16 points overall. in the second half. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess the sort of disappointment, a lot of people wanted to see Asar be in the summer league team, and he's not. And then other people wanted to see Marcus Sasser dominate. He's been he good. hasn't quite done that. Yeah. He had a really good game last game, um, but still wanting to see more out of him. And then the surprise is it's – Dennis Jenkins. Dennis Jenkins, yeah. yeah. Um, Free agent signing from St. John's, mm-hmm. formerly at Iona. Yeah. And boy, could he he can shoot it. Yeah. From deep, too. Right. So he looks pretty good, too. Mm-hmm. Um, outside of that, for me, guys that I've liked watching, I, it's funny because it's a lot of the big guys seem to be doing really well. Obviously, the Sixers. Jared McCain's been playing well. Yeah. Adem Bona has played really well. He just signed a contract, actually. Um, so that's really cool. But then, like, the Heat with Khalil Ware, he's looked they, really good at times. Been, yeah. Which they're, I, they're, they're like a B-team NBA team, actually. Yeah. And then uh, I can't believe Jaime Hawkins played in a game. Seeing him out there is so funny. It's <laughs> like when Devin Booker played in his second year yeah. and was just destroying, and they were like, you have to sit down. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool, though, that you get to see, like, Hey, did this guy really make the jump? Yeah. Put him in summer league. Flashes it. He's okay, a clear NBA good. player. Um, and then the other funny one that I, you know, I forgot about because we haven't really seen him a whole lot since since college is uh, Sonogo. He's been dominating yeah. for the Raptors. Yeah. He's like a double double machine. How he plays absolutely. I, I don't think he's going to be anything for the NBA. I think he might be a good. I think he bench. could be a good backup center yeah. for the Bulls. But he's not going to be like just because effort is a skill now. Right. And he's gonna give you full effort every time he comes into the. And game. he's a big body and stuff, but yeah. uh, I've been I've been liking a lot of the you know the uh, the big guys, which is kind of cool. I think even I think I think I saw uh, PJ Hall had a pretty decent game. Yeah, he's been solid for Denver. Um. So yeah. Unfortunately, Daron Holmes tore his Achilles, and that yeah that's tough. He's gonna miss his first year. Yeah. And Zach Eady right now is the favorite to win Rookie of the Year. He could be. He's gonna get a lot of minutes. Him and Ja. Yeah. So for you, who has been your guys that you've watched so, pay attention to? I mentioned them just before we started. Alex R has a long way to go. He's not offensively ready, but their second pick, Bub Carrington from Pitt, mm-hmm. kid is a bucket. Yeah, He can shoot it. He looks confident. He looks like he could come in. They might need to trade Jordan Poole because mm-hmm. I'm giving Bub Carrington all the minutes he needs. Yeah, he's He's like their most comfortable scorer at that position and shooter probably right now. Mm-hmm. I like Bob Carrington a lot. Besides their first game, M- Batas Buzelis has been pretty impressive for the Chicago Bulls. Yeah. I like what he's done. He's been a little inefficient, but again, like I said, the Pistons yeah. didn't draft him. He can do well. It's all right. Yeah, That's fine, but just didn't want him on the team. Yeah, Dalton Connect has been kind of efficient. He's taken a lot of shots, but you can clearly see the ability is there. Yeah. Once, once they put him in the system, he'll be more comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, who else is really well? Yeah, the Timberwolves, yeah, but that's I mean, not a surprise. Like we, Rob, Rob Dillingham started off rough. He had a good game last, but we know. Um, yeah. see me in names. Terrence Shannon. Yes, Terrence Shannon started off great. Has been playing well. Mm-hmm. Uh, who are you about to bring up? I, I was about to say the obvious one that we're missing is Reed Shepard. <laughs> Save the best for last. The, the only person that shut him down is the Pistons. <laughs> 
Yeah, most of the top picks that weren't aren't really worth talking about much. Yeah. Uh Zach so Ruth, Castle looked pretty good, but he had yeah. to sit out another game, so yeah. we haven't seen Zach his Zach Shea has been decent. Mm -hmm. I'll give him that. He's been all right. Still doesn't have much handle, but it is what it is. Donovan Klingon started slow. He played well last game. And Reed Shepard. Yeah. He came out he, firing. He looks like a combination of a lot of guys. And I'm not comfortable saying all their names right now because they're Hall of Famers, but mm -hmm. he showed some things that he couldn't show at Kentucky. Yeah. His, even with him having great games there. I was going to say, his highlight tape from the Summer League, he looked way more confident. He just looked like he was more aggressive. It, it was wild. And I'm excited to see what he can do uh, with Houston. So, yeah. Uh, any other guys that you can think of? Poor Bronny. <laughs> Are we Listen. sure we need to use poor? He just got an $8 million contract. So I'm saying because he was forced into the – now, he said he wanted to go pro. His yeah. dad said, okay, you're going to be a Laker. Mm -hmm. Cool, LeBron, you flexed your power. That's great. Everybody on the planet knew he wasn't ready. Yeah. And it is obviously clear that he is not ready. So it's it's rough for him. He hasn't hit a three yet. It's unfortunate. But it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. He just has to get better, I guess. Mm -hmm. He'll be in the G League. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so that's basically all the news and notes that we had. Um, just talking about a little bit of basketball. We got some college and NFL stuff starting to creep in. Uh, Brandon Ayuk has requested a trade from the San Francisco 49ers. Um, obviously, the Niners don't have to do anything about that unless he decides to maybe hold out and cause a fuss. Problem is, the only other time we've really seen that happen is Le'Veon Bell, and that didn't really work out too well for him. So uh, we'll kind of wait and see before we start talking about that kind of stuff. Um, but like I said, today we wanted to talk about kind of our top guys that transitioned their game in the NBA, whether it's, you know, they just aged gracefully or they had to completely change the style of their play to make it through um, or overcoming an injury and coming back from it um, to kind of revitalize their career also is, is on the table. So Malik, how many guys did you come up with or how many guys were you thinking of doing? Did you want to kind of... So total, uh, let me get back into it. It just closed out for a second. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. And I have two players put together at one spot. Okay. So, yeah, a special spot for two guys. Okay. But ten players total. All right. So I got about ten as well. So we can kind of quickly go through the maybe the first five or so, and then we can spend a little more time as we get closer to the top. Okay. Um, you want to start or? Uh, you can start because I'm trying to figure out my order. Okay. <laughs> So, I might just do all my 10, my number 10, like all my honorable guys or all the guys that I'm kind of on the fence about. The first one I'll mention is a really recent one. Helped the team win a championship. Completely changed his game from what it was when he first came in the league. I'm going to go with Brooke Lopez. Mm. He was a straight-up post guy, had really high-level post moves, was almost a 20-10 and 10 guy for the New Jersey Nets. Flashback to his rookie year. Yep. He was a really good player from the jump. They transitioned to Brooklyn. He started shooting some mid-range jumpers. Mm -hmm. Darren Williams started getting hurt. Those old guys started going out. He started taking some threes, and he started – it looked good when he shot threes. He started taking like two or three of them a game. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, he ends up in Milwaukee, and this dude is taking like six or seven threes a game yeah. and hitting them at a high clip. Like he's almost a 40% three-point shooter over the past three, four years. And he is a big reason why Milwaukee won a championship. Mm -hmm. Like a defensive piece off the bench that was huge for him. And a guy that was reliable hitting threes, barely, rarely ever in the post anymore. Mm -hmm. Seven feet tall, a big uh, paint defender, and a three-point shooter. So his evolution was really interesting to watch because I don't. I, there really weren't many like traditional bigs that have done it besides him. Yeah. That was as seamless as he's done it. So, yeah, first one, Brooke Lopez. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to lump a bunch of guys in because I can't figure out my okay. order. <laughs> um, but it kind of works out because they're all somewhat of the same for the most part. Um, 
So like my nine and 10 ish kind of guys, I'm going to go with Vince Carter and Jason Richardson, both crazy high flying slashers um, early on in their careers. Um, Jason Richardson make a couple all-star games or uh, no, just the dunk. I was going to say, I don't think he made an all-star yeah. team, um, but Vince Carter definitely did. And they both transitioned, had pretty long careers, ended up being more of three point specialists by the end of their careers. Um, but we're on meaningful teams, um, especially Vince Carter moving yeah. on. And, Vince in Dallas was when I really realized how well he transitioned. Yeah, and even even wildly enough, he provided a good spark for a, a young Magic team when he yeah. was on them. That was uh, arguably Orlando. like their best team. Yeah. But they didn't make the finals. Right. Um, so those are two guys that I kind of thought of really quickly um, that were back on the back half of guys that I was looking at. Okay. Um the other one that I did want to – oh, the other one that falls into that category, not as much, but one that you don't think about either, Eric Gordon. Eric Gordon, when he first came into the league as, uh, with the Clippers, was more he of a – He was like a slasher and a scorer. Yes, he was more yeah. of just an overall sh- scorer, where now he is a straight-up three-point specialist. Yeah. And a lot of championship teams keep looking at uh, Eric Gordon to be that three-point guy for their team. So Okay, so uh, my nine and eight. Uh, two flashy point guards from the early 2000s mm. that transitioned and became championship contributors. Uh, my nine, Jason Williams, white chocolate, okay. was known for being the crazy handles, flashy pass guy That's a good for point. the Kings. They traded him for Mike Bibby and instantly became championship contenders. He bounced from Memphis to another squad and ended up in Miami mm-hmm. around 05, 06. And he still threw some flashy passes, but... He toned it down. The turnovers cut down. Mm-hmm. His shot efficiency went up. And him and get him and old Gary Payton kind of like just drove the ship yep. for young D. Wade and, and Shaquille O'Neal mm-hmm. and just played steady basketball and helped them win a championship in 06. Mm-hmm. So Jason Williams at nine. Okay. And my number eight is Jason Kidd. Okay. All-time great Hall of Fame superstar point guard. Carried the Nets to two finals appearances. Mm-hmm. The East was kind of weak, but still, getting the Nets to the finals back-to-back years was really an incredible feat. Mm-hmm. As he got older, he developed he developed a three-point shot, which he didn't really have in New Jersey. And by the time he got to Dallas in 2010, he took a step back. Yeah, Dirk took over. Jason Terry was the shooter. There were several other scorers ahead of him. Mm-hmm. And he literally he became the leader of the team. Just, yeah, low turnovers, putting everybody in the right position, hitting timely threes, and just making sure everything stayed where it was supposed to be at all times. That's what Jason Kidd's role, it was at a higher level early in, earlier in his career. But then as he went from superstar to just veteran point guard, he led the ship to a 2010 Dallas team that had one of the most impressive championship runs in league history. So Jason Kidd at eight. Yeah. Um, I'll lump these next two guys in together to be kind of my eight as well. Um, even a nine and eight if you want to do it. But similarly, uh, these are two guys that in the beginning of their careers were scorers. We mentioned one already, Brooke Lopez. Now, when I first started making this list, Brooke Lopez was my number one. Hmm. Uh, but I, I changed that because he didn't age. He hasn't aged as well. He's been an integral player part of his team but he's been still kind of spotty here and there um and the other one is Boris Diaw so both being really high level scorers early on in their careers transitioning into 3 and D stretch big kind of guys is really interesting to me Boris Diaw being on that um famous Suns team of 2006 and things and then transitioning, having a, a decent career for the rest of his career, and then being well-known for being on the Spurs uh, late in his career. And then the other thing that I was going to mention about Brooke Lopez that I think you – I don't know if you mentioned. He's the number one scorer for the New Jersey-Brooklyn franchise all time. That's wild. And people kind of forget that. And he was, like, such a dominant big man yeah. at the time. And the other thing that I didn't know that I looked into – I think it was in the first four years of his career, however long he was with New Jersey, he only shot seven threes. 
And yeah. then <laughs> the following season, when he got traded to L.A., I believe, he shot like 15 or something in a limited amount of games or something like that. And then the following season, he shot like over 200 threes or 300 threes. Yeah. And it just forever changed. And then he worked on his defense. Like, he wasn't known as a crazy defender early on in his career. Either. He was just post up, back to the back score. Um, and so he was able to transition both into a three point shooter and defense. Boris Diaw, kind of similarly, he was he was like a weird slashing four, yeah. almost a similar. It's style. like he did everything and like nothing elite, but everything yes. very well. And he had a really good mid range. He was like a a. It was like he modeled his game after his teammate Amari Stoudemire, but on a, a smaller yeah. scale. Um, and then he transitioned as well, like I said, into more of a three-point shooter and defender. So those two guys kind of going together. So quickly, my my uh, seven and six. My seven is Derrick Rose. After his injuries and him falling off from an MVP candidate, it took him a while to find himself again. Mm-hmm. We don't talk about the Cleveland year. We don't talk about it. But he shows up in Minnesota. Actually, he he went to New York before Cleveland. Had a decent year. And then the Cleveland mess. But he goes to Minnesota and all of a sudden becomes one of the best like off the bench point guards scoring wise in the league. Mm-hmm. Scores 50. A really emotional like I love watching the clip of him scoring 50 because everybody was just so hyped and emotional for the moment. Yeah. And he came to Detroit and was also valuable for Detroit. Mm-hmm. Even though they weren't a high level team, you could depend on Derrick Rose to come in and score and be consistent every time he came in the game. So Derrick Rose at seven. And then six, Lamar Odom Mm. came in the league as a top pick known as like that weird hybrid 6'10", got the handles, got the jumper. He was supposed to be like a generational superstar. Didn't happen. It was in that horrible Clippers era where nobody could really succeed. Mm -hmm. Him, Darius Miles, Quentin Richardson, they were exciting, but they weren't that good. Yeah. And Lamar jumped from a few teams. He went to Miami and he ends up in L.A., Fresh off of Shaq leaving L.A., Kobe's trying to figure things out, and Lamar Odom becomes a key glue piece to what became the late 2000s championship Lakers. Mm-hmm. He, stripped, he stripped away most of the fancy stuff. He became a high-level defender. He was a dependable guy. Whenever you needed a bucket, he still had that talent. Mm-hmm. And he was still a playmaker at 6'10". He could still take over like when Derek Fisher wasn't dribbling. He could bring the ball up court, set up offense, and get guys in the right position. Yeah. So I think Lamar Odom made a great transition in his career going from supposed to be a superstar high-level guy to a high-level role player with yeah. a lot of talent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. Um, All right, my next guy, which is basically my, is basically my number six. Um, I'm going to go with a more recent player coming off of a – recent championship, Drew Holiday. Drew Holiday, hmm. starting with Philly. He was also more of a slasher, kind of young young gun. Made one all-star team as yep. the guy. Yep. Um, and then basically after, like, his rookie season, he, like, almost immediately started averaging, you know, 14 points a game or so. Um, and then that would be basically his career. But he transitioned his style to where – he was more of a defender, a leader on a team. So when he got to New Orleans, he was more... He was the ultimate glue piece. Right. He could give you anything you needed. Yes. Um, and then he's he's even gotten more into three-point shooting as you know the game has just evolved in general. Um, and now we've seen him on championship contending teams, and he is a solid, solid piece. And at this point, he's already 34 years old, which I, is wild yeah. to me. Um, but we've seen him in Milwaukee and then now Boston, and he's just been a steady piece throughout his entire career, even through kind of a style change. And now he is known as one of the best defenders in the league still at his age, probably of this generation, maybe the best guard perimeter defender. Yes. Yeah. I I like to say, especially on ball. Yeah. He's what people used to think Jay Crowder was. (laughs) Because <laughs> yeah. remember that stretch of like five years where yeah. every playoff team would sign Jay Crowder? Mm-hmm. And he, it kind of worked out in Phoenix. Yeah. But by the time he got to Miami, it was like, okay, Jay, like mm-hmm. we, we see what this is. Yeah. Drew Holiday is like the real version of that. Right. Yeah. So I thought Drew Holiday is a good 
a good fit. So my number five is it's technically my five and four, but I'm combining two players into one spot because they did the exact same thing. They both had to uh, let go of their egos and stop being superstars. And they had to compromise because they are playing with one guy. Mm, okay. The quote unquote greatest player of all time, LeBron James. Mm. And these two players are Chris Bosch and Kevin Love. Okay. I think before them two, there weren't many cases of this happening. Yeah. I mean, it, it was the beginning of the super team era, but everybody knew it was LeBron and D Wade as like the super, super duper stars of the mm-hmm. Miami Heat. So what was Chris Bosch's role? Third option. He became the ultimate third option. Mm-hmm. Kind of what Manu perfected in San Antonio, but it was different in San Antonio because they had their own system. Chris Bosch had to figure out how to be a superstar still. But whenever whenever you get the ball, we need you to be Chris Bosch. Mm-hmm. We also need you to defend. We also need you to rebound like you're still Toronto Chris Bosch. But you're still you're not going to get the touches you get. Like nobody knew how it was going to work out. And he let his ego go and became an excellent third guy. Yeah. And was a superstar in his role. And the reason why he's a Hall of Famer. Because even after becoming a superstar, he was still that guy. Mm-hmm. You go to Kevin Love in Cleveland, monster numbers in Minnesota, 30 30 game, perennial all star, didn't win in Minnesota. He decides to let go of his ego. He wants to win a championship, follows LeBron, joins Kyrie, becomes a absolute knockdown three point shooter, mm-hmm. high level rebounder. Was never the best defender, but he gave full effort at all times. Yeah. Helped them win a championship. Mm-hmm. Followed the mold of Chris Bosch. And I think to I think after that we really haven't seen that exactly. Right. Those two guys fit those two roles mm-hmm. for LeBron. Yeah. And nobody's really done it since. Mm-hmm. They both perfect perfected it, both won championships, and both figured out how to adjust yeah. in the middle of them being superstars. Mm-hmm. Well, our top five might be very similar um, because my top, my number five was Chris Bosh. Nice. (laughs) Um, Nice. And I'm just going to, because I don't, I didn't know exactly how to order my top five anyway. I'll also just mention Kevin Love because he's in my top five. Okay. Um, So both of those guys are also in my top five. The other thing that I'll bring up is just their past careers. Chris Bosh was the focal point of the new Toronto Raptors. Like yeah. he was supposed to bring the Raptors back to what they were when they had Vince, yeah. and for a little bit because of the Pistons that we watched when we were younger, yes, he could never get over the hump. Right, um, but people forget how elite he was. Yes. His his mid range was insane. Knockdown. He had great post moves, and that's the other thing. He's another one of those big men, and this is a a thing of LeBron. He had to transition into three point yes. shooting. He yeah. had to step out farther, and he did it pretty gracefully. And he actually kind of became a little bit better of a defender. And I wish he would have stuck with the dreads, but, you know, Fresh beggars Bosch. can't be yeah. choosers. <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, he he definitely had a, like, superstar level career before he came to the Heat. Yeah. And it's one of those things, like, I wish he would have stayed with the Raptors. I know that's, you know, you win a championship, who cares? See, the the sad part is... Once LeBron went back to Cleveland, before Chris Bosh got that blood clot, mm-hmm. it was him and D Wade, and Chris Bosh looked like he was going to go back to being him again. Yeah, but then it it he got that medal. Yeah, yeah. It, and that, that's the other thing that I'll say about Chris Bosh over Kevin Love is that he actually gr- aged more gracefully. Like Kevin Love has been kind of non-existent the last couple of years, even with Cleveland being a playoff contender yeah. for multiple years. He was kind of pushed to the side. He would have big games here and there, just his playing time diminished uh, entirely. But again, the Kevin Love in Minnesota was insane. This guy never touched the three point line. He was all post. Well, he, uh, his last few years in Minnesota, yeah. he started shooting it. Yeah, and people realized how good of a shooter but he was. He, yeah, those first like three years, Minnesota, mm-hmm. beast on the double boards. double machine. Yeah. Multiple like 30 20 games. Did he have a 30 30 game? Yeah, he had a he was one he was, of the few, yeah, craziness. Um, and then the other thing that I, I give a lot of credit to Kevin Love, he's been really open about um mental struggles in the NBA. Yeah, his last year in Cleveland was tough, yeah, which you know, some people say toughen up, 
I'm kind of like right on the line of it of like, you know, some people in the bubble I felt were being a little dramatic. And then, you know, there is that line that I think is important to know. Like at the end of the day, these guys are just people. But the other thing that I give Kevin Love a lot of credit to is just transforming his body. He was massive yeah. with, with Minnesota. But to play with LeBron in a faster tempo team and shooting threes, he slimmed down tremendously. And, I mean, to be able to do that and transition your game stylistically is pretty tough. So kudos to him and shows you the level of player that he was. Um, so, yeah, I think – those are great picks. Like I said, okay. both of my top five. So we'll yeah. see if we keep going. Well, since since I combined them as five, they're technically technically five and four. Mm-hmm. So now I'm in my top three. Okay. So my number three, it hits close to the heart. It's sad. It was like his best season in the last stretch of his prime. I'm going Blake Griffin. Oh. Okay. He didn't make my cut. So we do have a different top it's, three. It's mainly because of the Pistons thing. Mm-hmm. He was the high-flying Superman. In L.A., it was Lob City, him and DeAndre. He did some insane stuff. Yeah. Dunking on people for the Clippers. Mm -hmm. They could never win. They could never get over the hump. The last era of the the Donald Sterling Clippers. Mm -hmm. Thank God that ended. And it was a weird end to the Clippers era for Blake. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, I remember being in my dorm room in 2016. (laughs) And me and my roommate got the alert that Blake Griffin got traded to the Pistons Mm -hmm. in a blockbuster move. And we had no idea how to feel. Yeah. It was just a, such a weird move. Mm -hmm. Little did we know he was literally going to give like the rest of his, his body, his athleticism and his prime. He gave like every last bit of it to the Pistons. Yeah. And that's why I appreciate him forever. Like, except for his last dunk. True. (laughs) That's that's another thing though. Yeah. But dropping 50 on Philly, I think that that was that week two of the season. I, I can't remember if it was week one or week two. But putting 50 on the 76ers and Joel Embiid, mm-hmm. he was still dunking on people. He was bringing the ball up court and handling. He was hitting ISO threes, <laughs> coming off a of pick. Like, if you, you go back and watch that season of Blake Griffin, yeah, it is true high-level elite, like, individual basketball. Mm-hmm. He had to like scratch and claw the Pistons to the playoffs. Yeah. And he he did everything he could. He was I think it was 25 and 10 or 25 and 9. He was an all-star, almost all NBA. And it was the one it was the year you saw what the peak of Blake Griffin of Blake Griffin could have been if he stretched it out. Yeah. Like he was an absolutely elite four man mm-hmm. that did everything for the Pistons. Yeah. And they won 40, was it 42, 43 games, I think. Just a, a little bit over 40. Yeah. And that's all they could get because that's how much he, he had to give them. Mm-hmm. And they made the playoffs, and by that time, it started to fall off. Yeah. His knees started failing him. He still played, which set him back even more. Yeah. Because they got swept by the Bucks, but he still tried to play his heart out. And I, I appreciate I appreciate Blake Griffin for what he did that one season. Mm-hmm. And going from like superstar, just athlete, Blake Griffin to complete player, yeah, for one season, he was like a top three power forward in the league that year, mm-hmm. and that's why I put Blake Griffin at three. Okay, um, my number three is more of just a a fun pick necessarily, um, because I felt like this is a guy that you can't you can't fully leave out, but he didn't have like a great career overall. And that's Sean Livingston. He's my number two. Nice. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. I'll so let you start. If you think statistically, <laughs> he's more of a fun pick. But everybody he knows. He deserves to be in the top three of this list. <laughs> everybody knows what he did for the Warriors. And his story, but even yeah. before the war, what he went through. So yeah. the other crazy part, too, is like pr- most people probably don't know. Drafted by the Clippers, fourth overall pick. Yeah, he he was seen as like a generational prospect, right? Because six seven exactly handles speed, athleticism. That he was, was something he was going to go to Duke, but then he just chose to go to uh, the NBA. Yeah, and it was something back then that we didn't really see too often. Yeah, you didn't see big point guards like that. He was he was kind of he was a modern day point guard yeah. back then. Yeah, because he was he wasn't just tall; he was lanky, yeah. had length. Um, 
he showed some promise in his first couple years with the Clippers, and then yeah, the year they made the run, they uh, won a uh, playoff series in 05. Mm-hmm. He was starting to like really come into his own. Yeah, was it? And then the injury was the third season, I believe. So I think so. Yeah. He, it's one of the most horrific injuries you'll ever see. Yeah, he tore about every ligament like, in b- his besides leg. Besides Kevin Ware, where the bone popped out. Yeah, his bone is like popping through this. You don't see it, mm-hmm. but it's popping through the skin. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, there's been multiple stories on it and they talk about similar to Alex Smith in football. They almost amputated his leg because it was so beyond repair. Missed almost three years of basketball. Yeah. And then he, he bounced around all over the place for a while. He was in like Brooklyn and Cleveland. Brooklyn is where he started getting back on. Cleveland is where he was. Yeah. Yeah. He, he wasn't himself in Cleveland. Right. And then, uh, it was like 2011, 2012. Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. This is when he popped up, and we were like, "Sean Livingston." <laughs> yeah, he's back. Yeah, and then, and then he started getting minutes. Yeah, <laughs> and then he was hitting jumpers. Right, <laughs> and yeah, and then 2015, he joined the Warriors. Um, and from there on, it was like history. Now he only averaged like six, seven points a game during the season. Something about the playoffs for Sean Livingston. <laughs> Was a different story. No missed mid-range jumpers. <laughs> there is all the memes about has he ever missed a mid-range? <laughs> yeah. Um, Sean Livingston seemed like every time he got, he was similar. He's similar to like Tayshawn Prince in a way where there's moments and like glimpses where you see like he could have been something. Yeah. Um, but he never got his full potential because of circumstances or things like that. Um. And his demeanor at times, like Sean Livingston was known for having like turnaround mid ranges all the time. And he had such a high release. It was hard to stop. He became a really good defender on that Warriors team too, because of his length. And he just did so many things right for them. I don't know what else you have to yeah, add. I mean, but For like a three year span, he was unanimously known as the best backup in the league. Yeah. And you're right in the, in the regular season, he just did his regular thing. Come off the bench, run the offense, hit a few mid range jumpers. But like you said in the playoffs, mm-hmm. every time he came, he would have a run. He would make a play. I remember, I think it was the 2016 finals. He crossed somebody against the Rockets. I think he crossed James Harden and dunked on Clint Capella. And like, that's the peak of young Sean Livingston, yeah. where you'd be like, this guy's 6'7, mm-hmm. he has handle and he's athletic. Yeah. And he has mid range. Like, mm-hmm. At that point, he was old, so he only showed it every now and then. Yeah. But he had those moments in the playoffs where he looked almost unstoppable. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, he, Sean Livingston, his comeback from what he went through was amazing. And like really Chris Bosh, though, wish he would have kept the dreads. <laughs> well, he, he had braids. Oh, did he have he, braids? He had, he had like, okay. cornrows. Oh, you're right, you're right. Yeah. I like I like the short fro he had yeah. in Golden State. I like Oh, the yeah, he did grow it out. You're right, yeah. you're right. <laughs> But um, yeah, Sean Sean Livingston absolutely deserves. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah. it's wild that his career kind of like after those couple championships with the Warriors, he just decided to call it quits. I think he retired at thirty two. If something. I was him, I'm a, I would have done it too because like yeah. he he did what he didn't reach the peak of what people thought he was going to be, but he did what he what he set out to do. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, be a high level contributor on a championship team. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So since my number one is next, do you want to just do your number two? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Okay. Wait, who was your number three? My number three was um <laughs> I just forgot it that fast. My number three was Blake Griffin. Oh, that's yeah, right. that was my number that's three. Right. Okay. Yeah. My, so so my number two, and I don't I don't know if this is your number one. Who is your, who would else who would else who else would be your number one? So my number two is Andre Iguodala. Okay. I didn't have him okay. on my list. Hey, that's good. That's good. I <laughs> yeah. like that. I mean, it's excellent pick. Okay, yeah. so I, I've talked about Andre Iguodala in length, uh, you know, in previous podcasts. It's weird because his his most notable moments are when he's with the Warriors, when he's in his mid-30s. And I just always feel terrible. He was one of my brother's favorite players growing up. Yeah, We grew up on Sixers it, Iguodala. His, yeah. his Sixers era was crazy. He was one of the most high-flying slashers in the NBA at the time. Yeah. And he was a multiple-time All-Star back then. Uh, did he win a dunk contest? 
He lost he to Nate Robinson. He should have won a dunk contest. But that dunk he did under the rim. But, yes. Yeah. I, listen, I still give it to Nate. Yeah. But he, his performance was elite. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then he went to Denver and kind of did the same thing. Got him to the playoffs. And he yeah. was still good. I, I loved that team. Mm -hmm. But the the Mark Jackson Warriors, that's when the Warriors first came into their own. Yeah. Because they played, it was Nuggets Warriors in the first round. Mm -hmm. And Iguodala lost to the Warriors. Yeah. And so he was like, he averaged 20 points a game for a, a while. Never made an all-star team in Philly, which is wild. Or he made one. I think he made one. He made one, one all-star team. Um, yeah. But yeah, you're right. Like kind of under the radar. The, the teams weren't very good Yeah. Uh, for the most part. Because he was the transition um, from Allen Iverson, basically. Um, and then, yeah, when he got to the Warriors, it was... It was kind of like Sean Livingston where everything kind of clicked. And yeah. When he first got traded there, he was seen as he was going to be like him and Steph were going to be the stars. Right. And but he yeah. was not. But he was good for the team. Yeah. And he became another 3 and D player. And, again, he was another guy that seemed to step up in the playoffs. Finals MVP, Andre yeah. Iguodala. Um, crazy to think that that even happened on, that, on a Warriors team, but it did. And it was because he was – High level defender, and when he was younger, he couldn't shoot for crap. I'll be honest. He had a decent, he had a decent mid range, not a good three point shooter when he was yeah. younger. He and had a, he had a de solid mid range. Yeah, and he was clutch, so he he mm -hmm. had clutch jumpers. But as he aged, he only shot threes for the most part. Um, and it was water, <laughs> and he <laughs> was really good. Yeah. Um, so he provided a lot of good offense for the team when they needed it. He was kind of the vocal leader, I think, for a lot of the time. Um, he he probably kept Draymond Green under control bay, too. Yeah. To be honest, like Draymond was like the emotional leader. Mm -hmm. Andre Iguodala was like the the real like the yeah. mental. He kept everything under right. control. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I thought he needed to be mentioned. So listen, I think he's like this generation Scottie Pippen, mm. and he has said it. As, I can't remember what podcast it was. It might have been All the Smoke. But I want, he had a whole interview with them where he basically said he never wanted to be the guy in the NBA. Yeah. Like, he he loved playing next to AI. And when AI left, he was never fully comfortable with, like, being the go-to scorer. Mm -hmm. That's why he always hovered around, like, 19, 20 a game. Yeah. Because he, he wasn't, like, trying to be the big bucket. He loved playing defense. He loved getting people involved. He liked, like, playing winning basketball. That's what Andre Iguodala always cared about. I think Scottie Pippen was kind of like a similar way. Mm -hmm. If you needed him to score 20, 21, 22, he could. But Andre Iguodala cared about winning basketball. Mm -hmm. And wherever he went, teams increased winning. Like, I, I remember they they upset Chicago, I believe. It was after Derrick Rose got hurt. Mm -hmm. But they upset Chicago in 2010 or 2011. Uh, him and Drew Holiday were nice together. And, yeah, he just – yeah, he deserves to be on the list. I forgot he was only in Denver for One a season. year. And was, I it, also, was it 12-13 um, or 11-12? Yes, 12-13. Okay, yeah. And I'm also forget, I also forgot that he played in Miami for two years before coming back to the Warriors, yeah. which is wild. Anyway, all right, number ones. Uh, my number one. You know, I, I've – told you how much respect I have for this guy. He's beloved in the basketball community, players and fans. A recent Hall of Famer in the last, like, three, four years. A guy that could have been a superstar player in any other situation, was a superstar in his role off the bench. Hmm. But as he got older, he maintained a high level and still was switching roles all the time. He's one of the few players in NBA history, history that constantly switched roles from season to season, and it always worked. Okay. And this is Manu Ginobili. Yeah. Started off the career. You're coming off the bench, Manu. Okay. Rookie year, they won a championship. Mm -hmm. He becomes an all-star off the bench in 05. Mm -hmm. Or was that the year he started? I, I think 07 was when he started, yeah. All-star off the bench. They beat the Pistons. 07, he starts. They beat the Cavs. Mm -hmm. I think he mainly, I can't, I can't even remember what years he was on the bench and what years he was off. Yeah. 
But near the end, when Kawhi came in, he was more he was the superstar off the bench again. Mm-hmm. But then Tim retires. Tony gets traded to Charlotte. Another dark memory we should all forget. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Kawhi Leonard becomes a superstar. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, old Manu Ginobili starts balling. <laughs> And they get in the playoff series against, like, the Rockets. Mm-hmm. And when Kawhi is out the game, Manu is still doing Manu stuff, almost, like, 40 years old. Yeah. Actually, this is this is near when Derek White came in. So I think Kawhi was in Toronto at this point. Mm-hmm. It was, like, Manu, LaMarcus Aldridge on his, in his last year, Derek White. I can't remember who else. But he's crafty with the ball. He's still dunking on people. Mm-hmm. He's hitting clutch shots. like. Whether it was off the bench or starting or in whatever place they wanted to put him, Manu was Manu, and he did it in every way and was a high-level player at all times, Mm -hmm. even in the end, hitting 40. Yeah. Like, I I just I have so much respect for his game and the type of player he was. So I I have to put him at number one just because he could adjust and, and transition into anything you wanted him to be to the end. Yeah. It was always a high level player. Hmm. Nice. That's a good pick. I like that one. I Manu kind of slipped my mind on that, but again, he's not one of my favorites, so he doesn't always come top of mind, unfortunately. Um, okay, my number one is another one that I've talked at length about before. Um, maybe not the craziest uh stylistic change. Well, it, it's pretty drastic. But I guess I didn't realize like how I thought he was much less effective in his later years than when I go back and look at the stats. And guy's a superstar, one of the best players in the NBA um, for multiple years. He played till he was 38. Ray Allen. Hmm. So okay. And the only reason I I have to I had to think about it for a and second. And the only reason but, yeah. I say that is because I loved. Milwaukee and Seattle Ray Allen. Seattle Ray was a monster, absolute monster. And a lot of people don't know Milwaukee Ray. He was a problem too. Was a high flying slasher that shot forty percent from three. Like <laughs> yeah, but at that time you didn't shoot a ton of threes. So for him to just be like dunking on people like crazy and just being an acrobat. Yeah, other like. 99 2000 was when he started to like up the volume. Yeah. They let him shoot more threes mm-hmm. because obviously he was like the best shooter in the NBA. Yeah. And then when he got to Seattle, he really vamped it up and started shooting his threes. Um, so we know now that like that can age well. But to be able to go from again, similar to Kevin Kevin Love and Chris Bosch, be the guy on his team for multiple teams, but then get part of the Boston big three and kind of become Almost not really a fourth option because Rondo isn't like a third option, but almost being the fourth in line because Rondo got so good on that Boston team. But he was still averaging like 15, 16 points a night for Boston even. And by the time he was at Boston, he was like 34, 35 or something like that. And he became basically a spot-up shooter. He, He became the best shooter of all time in Boston. And he continued that. All the way through Miami. He hit the biggest shot, quote unquote, the biggest shot yeah. in NBA history. And, and to me, like the, the part that makes it of him aging so well is he is 38 at this time. Just people knowing exactly what he's doing. And he's not like, he's not LeBron where it's like, he's some physical specimen, you know, like Ray Allen is a, I don't know. I, you can't say average NBA player, but <laughs> if you get what I mean, like he's in his 38 year season and people know he's going to spot up for three and they find ways to get him open. He finds ways to get open, has such a quick release that he can get his shot off and be super effective on a playoff caliber championship level teams. And even until, you know, the end of Miami, he was averaging still like 10, 12 points a game. Yeah. It, it took me, it took you bringing him up for me to realize He's had multiple different careers. Like mm-hmm. he was an all-star slasher and scorer in Milwaukee. Yeah, he was a superstar scorer and shooter 
in Seattle. Mm-hmm. He was an all star sniper in Boston. And then he was an off the bench sniper in Miami. Yeah. Clutch player for Miami, yeah. basically. Like that's that's four different types of players. Yeah. So throughout uh, the years. Again, it's not something like hardship or anything like that. He had probably one of the smoothest careers, to be honest, yeah. to go from, you know, superstar level to end of his career gets to be on championship teams. Um, but I think just the style of play that he had to change a little bit or alter, um, I think is impressive. And to be so effective throughout that time where some of these guys have fallen off a little bit later in their careers. And again, the top five for me is very interchangeable. I just felt like because I watched the most of Ray Allen when I was younger, unfortunately I didn't like the Boston and Miami years, but still you have to give him his props. Yeah. For- there was, there was a debate during Clay's prime if he could become like Seattle uh, Ray Allen. Mm-hmm. And I was one of the people that said, I think he could, Yeah, but we never got to see it. Right. It's just a big if, but mm-hmm. he's the reason why people were having those conversations with Clay. Yeah. And, and unfortunately now for Clay, we're going to see him in his back half of his career. Can he be effective as the third option yeah. on his team? Because Clay was basically like Boston Ray Allen with elite defense mm-hmm. in his prime. Yeah. Uh, I wish we could have got to see if he could have been that next level guy. Yeah, to be the guy on a team. Yeah, that'd be interesting for sure. All right, that's our list. Um, we got a couple minutes. I don't know if there's anything else to talk about. <clears throat> but um, well, we can continue our conversation that we started before. You got uh, college football 25. I did. And it's a big moment for yes. a lot of us uh, in our 30s or near our 30s. <laughs> Because it's been since 2014 that we've gotten a college football game, and people are loving it so far. How, how do you feel about it, Malik? Are you loving it? Are you feeling your childhood again? I wouldn't say I'm loving it yet, and it's because how difficult the game is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it is definitely fun, but the learning curve is steep. Yeah. This is not NCAA 14. Within like a, a few months, I was like beyond confident on NCAA 14. In my last like year playing it, I was, I was like, it was easy for me to go through a dynasty mm-hmm. and rebuild a team and get five star recruits and win championships. It wasn't that hard. By the time I was like near the end playing in CA fourteen, I feel like it's gonna take me a long time <laughs> to get even like very good at this game. Mm-hmm. Like, obviously they revamped everything, the gameplay, but listen. It, it's you gotta you gotta play on varsity if you just want to have it's still gonna be kind of tough on varsity but if you just want to have fun play on freshman if you just want to have fun <laughs> play on varsity if you want to have fun and a challenge yeah all American is where the challenge really starts mm-hmm. like I played my first game with Michigan against Minnesota Michigan has a, a excellent defense and some high level players mm-hmm. so obviously I won thirty seven to ten that was my first game. Mm-hmm. but I started playing some like lower level G five teams and boy, it was hard. <laughs> it It's, you gotta, you have to learn how to play this game, like precision passing, how to like place the ball in certain places with receivers. Mm-hmm. I haven't completed a deep ball yet. Interesting. Like a straight go. Yeah. I, I haven't completed a deep ball yet. <laughs> I'm good at throwing over the middle and like timing with like short passes. Mm hmm it's 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 hard the like the running game is so fast mm-hmm. you have to be like really locked in and have like know how to use the sticks yeah to be good at running defense i, I haven't gotten a hit stick y- hit yet <laughs> like tackling angles are even harder are harder than they've ever been mm. you have to be right on the money to complete regular tackles first of all i haven't I haven't even completed a hit stick tackle yet interesting that's how h- hard it is and how fast it is especially on All-American. Hmm. I won't even entertain Heisman. <laughs> I, I won't do it. <laughs> yeah. No way. But it's fun. But if if you want to challenge, get up to All-American. If you want to torture yourself, okay, go up to Heisman. I feel like only masters of the game can go to Heisman. Yeah. And that it's going to take a while to become a, a master of that game. Cool. I'm, a, I'm excited for it. I'm, I'm most likely going to get it at some point. I just don't know when. Um, but I'll be interested. Yeah. I haven't even started a dynasty yet. Like, I, I'm committed to, like, just getting comfortable with the game. Yeah. And I started a Road to Glory just yesterday. I was doing okay, and then I got frustrated and quit. 
because it's it's a uh, actual gauntlet <laughs> playing quarterback on Road to Glory on All American. It is something else. Like as I played in the ACC, I was a quarterback for Auburn, so nightmare. Mm-hmm. Like the defenses, sometimes the pass rushers get through all at the same time. <laughs> You barely have time to like look to make a pass. Yeah. So I I started use, utilizing the scramble and that worked in the Iron Bowl, but I couldn't beat Alabama. Mm. Lost by three. And I started the next season throwing two picks and a lost fumble, and I quit. Nice. Not a say. I'm not ashamed to say it. <laughs> I, I'm a new gamer again. Yeah. I haven't been legit playing games since I was playing NCAA 14, and my game got scratched up, too scratched up to play. About three to four years ago around the pandemic mm. is when my CD got too scratched up and I couldn't play it anymore. Mm. So yeah, I'm still on training wheels. Kind of <laughs> right. haven't taken them off. Awesome. Um, one final thing really, really quick because I just saw this ESPN put out their top 10 wide receivers list for the NFL season. Number one, Justin Jefferson. No, no surprise. Number two, Tyreek Hill. Number three, Jamar Chase. Okay. Number four, CeeDee Lamb. Number five, Devontae Adams. Oh, oh, oh. What? okay. Hmm? Yeah. Number six, A.J. Brown. Number seven, Amon Ross St. Brown. Okay. Number eight, Mike Evans. Number nine, Stephon Diggs. And number 10, Brandon Ayuk. Any glaring issues that's with that a, list? That's not a horrible. Amon Ross should be higher. He should be ahead of A.J. Brown to me. Brandon Ayuk being the tenth best receiver in the league isn't doesn't make me very comfortable. Yeah, I always kind of feel weird. I'm, about I'm that. not I'm not a big fan of that one. I'm sure I could think of somebody. The hard part is DeAndre Hopkins is getting old, so I don't know if he can be there anymore. I was gonna say that's that's the hard part. There's a lot of like either really young guys like Garrett Wilson, um, Jalen yeah. Waddle, Nico Chris Collins Olave. is going to be better than Brandon Ayuk, Devontae Smith. There's a yeah. lot of these young guys that could make it there, but hard to say. Cooper Cup being outside of the top ten, I know he's injured last year, but it's hard to see yeah, him that's, out of that's there. Wild. He's he's better than Brandon Ayuk, but injuries. Yeah. Um. Uh, I'm trying to look. Yeah, it, it, it's it. Well, Puka Nakua even having a crazy year. I know yeah. it's only one year, but I don't know. It, it's always funny when these lists come out. Um, and you have recency bias. Stefan Diggs at nine. I love Stefan Diggs, but he struggled so heavily down the stretch last year. I don't know. It's hard to say. I personally think, uh, what's the name of the receiver from the Steelers? Number 14. George Pickens. I personally think George Pickens is better than Brandon Ayuk. He just hasn't been able to prove it yet. Yeah. I, George Pickens is a beast. I'm confused a little bit by the Brandon Ayuk hype that there's been lately. Um, I think he's a good receiver that's improved by the system. Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree. Like, Debo is a more dangerous receiver than him. Yeah. I kind of agree, unfortunately. Um, and Justin Jefferson being number one, I mean, he yeah. had a thousand yards in like nine games. That's true. With <laughs> if he played a full season, we don't know what numbers he would have pulled. Yeah, put and up. it's just hard to say with having new quarterbacks. But I guess if they're just, I don't know how this list was working. But if you're just going off of like raw talent, same with like Devonte Adams, like his numbers have fallen off, but people still say he's one of the best yeah. route runners and things like that. So hard to take it away from him. It's just interesting. So, all right, finally. This has been Views from the Sidelines. Um, We'll see you guys next week, and um, we'll either have a list or, I don't know, maybe there'll be some more football news. We probably should start talking about football conferences just because it's going to take forever to get get through them all. So maybe we'll look into that too. But uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you, Blake Griffin, for what you did for the Pistons that one season. Thank you.